Well, Faith, I appreciate you being here with me on the the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast and specifically here for for our series on the impact Mm -hmm. of fashion. Uh, First off, if you wouldn't mind, for for folks who are unfamiliar with you and the work that you do, could you you provide us with a a brief introduction? Thanks for the pleasure and the honor of being here, Corey. I appreciate it. Talking about this uh, pretty important topic here, right? Fashion and um, the global climate. I'm Faith Lejeanre, and I'm coming to you from my home office here in uh, uh, Long Island. It's a little bit outside of New York City. And I um, love helping out uh, startups on up to larger companies around the circular economy. Wonderful. And uh, I, I'd love for you to, to share a little bit more as to, because the, the circular economy <laughs> is, is really such kind sure. of a broad, all-encompassing mm. uh, uh, space. Where are you specifically focused in this, this movement to advance uh, a circular economy? It's interesting because my clients are pretty broad, but <laughs> um, for the fashion industry, I've been helping out Donna Inc., uh, Shamani Donna from the Donna Inc. Company. I think Mm. that she's really disrupting the industry um, and she's the only one really out there doing full circularity um, with her DSphere platform. Uh, She's using technology in a really unique way to connect up local designers to make sure that all the textiles that are um, going to landfill now that, you know, in the future, that won't happen. Um, so, for example, when you log on to DSphere, you can uh, select from your own closet, which I think is just such a brilliant idea because you can mm. um, have these, I have, I'm 48, so I have a lot of clothes, right, from over the years. Um, and not necessarily am I going to wear my uh, freshman college t-shirt, you know, (laughs) Um, but I, it's really sentimental, right? So um, blending that into an item of clothing and saving those memories is just so super cool to me. And I think that's what needs to happen to disrupt the industry to make it circular is right now. um, It's so funny. The other day I was sitting down with this young lady and she had a special event at her school. She's, I think she's 16 years old. And she said, oh, I got to get a, I got to get, it's, you know, breast cancer awareness and I got to get a pink t-shirt. And, and so she was surfing on Amazon and her parents were like, well, why don't you borrow one from a friend, you know, that might have more than one, or why don't you, you know, figure look in your own closet, like to see what you have. I think that's what we need to do more of. And it was interesting because she said, oh, look, there's one here and it's like $5. And I said, why do you think it's $5? Mm -hmm. And it was a real eye opener, I think, for her. Um, She hadn't seen the movie True Cost. Uh, I hadn't shared that with her yet. And I said, what do you think that's made out of? And where that was made, do you think that those people were paid a livable wage? Do you think they had safe a safe place to work? Um, do you think that uh, there was any child labor involved in the making of that shirt? And it just I just wanted to ask the questions in a Socratic way <laughs> to get her to think, mm. because it is a true cost in that five dollars, and that cost is on humanity. It's on our planet. Um, And a lot of people say, oh, you know, well, the planet's going to be here. Absolutely. Right. (laughs) We're doing all of these things to become more circular because there's future generations. Uh, I want to ensure that future generations, that fashion is fully circular so that all generations to come, they they don't have soil that has been depleted from growing mass amounts of uh, cotton for textiles. Um, They don't have... Um, dyes that are full of chemicals that are in the water, you know, that we, you know, everything that we wear gets rinsed off, right? It goes right into our aquifers. It goes right into our water. And then we use that water on our plants. So we're eating everything. So I would say to people like, do you feel comfortable with chemicals that are on that $5 shirt, right? Um, you're sweating and you're breathing that in. So it's just interesting because I think that 
people are starting to think about that and see there's everything's connected. Everything's connected in nature and everything's connected back to us. And so if we're really conscious and we don't overproduce, there's enough textiles in the entire world right now to clothe everybody in the world and even the new billions of people that are coming for decades to come. We don't need to make anything. I always say never buy new, right? So that's what I love about what Shamani is doing because it's taking what's already in your closet. And it's also taking all of this. There's this thing called dead stock. And everybody um, mm. that I talk to that's outside the fashion industry, they don't understand it. They're like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Don't they use up? Do they make just amount? Because it's it's costly. They don't. It's absolutely not. Um, mm. They the fashion industry it has been burning for a long time at incinerators, brand new textiles. Uh, so I just think that, <laughs> you know, those are resources. People say, well, it's waste to energy, but I think if we keep doing waste to energy, then we'll just have a giant planet of a poof of energy and nothing left <laughs> at all. That's, that's <laughs> what happens. It's where those resources go to die. So um, when we keep these textiles in use, because they can be kept in use, the beautiful navy blue shirt that you're wearing, um, that can be kept in use for decades and it can turn into different things. You'll say, well, it's the trends and it's fashion. And I love fashion mm -hmm. I, because for me, when people get up in the morning and they put on something, they're like a blank slate and they're just painting that canvas and it's their form of expression. And I think we need that because art is part of life. But we need to do it in a really conscious way, in a really circular way. So when you're no longer in need of that shirt or it doesn't fit the style, let's use a local designer to redesign it, to remap it. And you can be part of that process, too. That's what I love about DSphere. I can click and I can drag whatever textiles and including that dead stock uh, from Stephanie Benedetto, the Queen of Raw. She's here in New York here. Um, because I have, you know, I only have a few of those old college t-shirts left that I want to put in. And I, I have um, some sleeves uh, that maybe, you know, I want to pick a different fabric for. And she's saved all of the, these textiles from landfill and from incineration. And they're beautiful. They're striped. They're plaid. They're paisley. They're plain colors. They're different styles, you know, that to, so you can express yourself. So if you don't have it, you know, in your closet, mm -hmm. you can pick and choose and click and drag and make your circular t-shirt and you can um, accompany that dead stock around you know your favorite college t-shirt or concert t-shirt or for me my Corey my grandmother she she wasn't a great sewer <laughs> but she loved to sew I mean she was always sewing in fact when we had to move her into the nursing home before she passed she's like just leave me with my sewing machine just you can take everything else but leaving with my sewing machine and she would sit there and she would she'd take old jeans I mean back before it was cool years ago and she would cut off the bottoms and save that fabric because she would do something else with it later and I just remember mm. her wearing it was a, a little pocketbook and it had it was the, the jeans it was the top part of the jeans and she'd put a little like a little strap <laughs> around it and then like she put her glasses and um, her little phone in the pockets because that was like they were already made, right? And then she put like this, um, she had she used to always go to thrift stores and collect all these like rope and ribbons and stuff. And she sewed this like top on it. And I was like, that's just the coolest bag, Nana. <laughs> like she was always <laughs> making stuff. And so when she passed away, my sister had cleaned out her place and uh, she said, you know, there's some there's some little pink sweatpants and she'd cut off the bottom because she liked little crop pants with her little sneakers and she had sewn on this little striped pocket from another remnant piece of fabric and I had them hanging in my closet and this was before I had met Shamini and then I thought well, what do I do with these pants like I cannot throw them away right I, I don't even want to give them away because they mean so much to me you know I remember sitting on my grandmother's lap when I was younger and she always wore these she just was she was she was making athleisure wear cool before it was athleisure wear cool now. <laughs> she was always in her little sweatpants, but you know had a little like fancy pocket on it. You know? <laughs> so I don't want to get rid of that, but I so I'm 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 blending that memory of my grandmother into my circular memory jacket, you know, with with uh, mm. Shamani Donna's uh, Donna D Sphere app, and I'll have that 
forever. And then I'll, you know, pass it on to, I don't have kids, but I'm going to pass it on to people I know that are one of my mentees that's younger, a lot younger than me. And I know that she'll love it and she'll carry on that memory and then pass it on to someone that, you know, will appreciate it as well. So it's this whole combination of culture, art, memories, really appreciating the fashion mixed in, integrated with the technology so that you can, I mean, I was so blown away when Shamini first showed me D-Sphere and she said, you know, just click whatever little square of fabric, how the system intricately knows, okay, we have just amount, that right amount of fabric to go in that spot in that width and depth and everything. And you just click and drag it mm. and you design it. And I'm not a great designer. <laughs> My dad was an artist, but I didn't <laughs> seem to inherit that piece. Um, so I'm going to use, you know, one of the designers that's, that I like, that's, you know, part of D-Sphere as well, that's local. And so it's, it's about creating jobs for artists and designers. It's about connecting community and also being really responsible with our textile resources and keeping those consistently in use. Um, I just mm. think that that is the perfect, you know, combination. So sorry, I ran on there. I told you a bunch <laughs> of stories, but... <laughs> No, uh, that's totally fine. I, I think it uh, sets a lot of context for us. I guess first, I mean, what all that you described there in, in I mean, the reason that we're here, Faith, is because we're we're talking about the impact mm. of fashion. You know, this this very uh, many of these these rich experiences that it seems you have in connection to to uh, you know various clothing items that you had as well. The, the earlier story you mentioned, the, the impact of, of sharing with that, that young person, the yeah. true cost, you know, of yeah. a $5 garment, uh, it's still very impactful information mm -hmm. right now. You know, so we're here having this conversation because we aren't where no. we need to be. Yeah. You know, things aren't uh, uh, as circular as we hope they were. Yeah. You know, the, the culture isn't uh, uh, where we hope it would be. Why do you think we aren't mm. there yet? Why aren't there more, you know, Shamini mm. uh, uh in your example there? Uh, wh what's what's the gap for us? Why aren't we all, you know, sharing a, a similar experience and appreciation that uh, it seems you've had in different instances there? I think it's, it's you know, it's like the convergence. What is it? The book, think uh, The Future is Faster Than You Think. It's now, it's like Shamini's taken advantage of the convergence of technology culture mm. and the situation right <laughs> in a good way mm. i think that it's hard to be i mean she's built this company up over 12 13 years so it wasn't a fly by night startup she's really thought it through she became a b corp um she's done everything the right way um uh, i think the larger organizations it's so hard for them that i work with they, they're not nimble. That's the first thing they say to me. We're not nimble. Mm. They're so deep seated in these supply chains that are, you know, using chemicals that are, you, you know, it's horrible to say, but um, I worked with an organization and they said, oh, we'd go to do audits and they would hide the kids. They would hide the child labor mm. when we went to do the audits. It's like these, so, and they're, but they're so deep seated in these supply chains. I mean, they have contracts. Some of those contracts are multiple year contracts. They can't even get out of them. They, mm. they're, it's, it's part of the financing. So I think that's the other thing too, you know, be cautious of the low cost item of, you know, clothing. It is, it's going to impact all of us from a humanity perspective, how we treat each other uh, with respect and dignity and from a planet perspective. Um, the other thing too is people say, well, there's this whole cultural thing too, Corey, that I will just, I'll give it, a, I'll give it to goodwill. I'll give it to, you know, these, I'll put it, you know, to the, the lupus foundation. They send me these little cards and they say, hey, we're going to be in your area. Put your clothes out. 90% of what go gets donated goes to incineration or landfill. 90% in pretty much every area in the world that happens. And that is, it's just, you think about all those resources. Someone took time to design that. Someone took time to mm -hmm. grow the cotton or the other, you know, whatever you're making it out of. Someone took time to make that, to sew it. 
Someone took time to dye it. It was shipped. The carbon emissions of shipping, right? <laughs> That's what I love about Donna. She's using local designers, local, you know, where the local, I'm like, what's in my area? What is, you know, Stephanie mm. Benedetto have here in New York, right? <laughs> so I can like reduce that. There's so many textiles. I live, you know, here and I see the waterways and I, I, I ask people, you know, what's coming in on the freight liners? You know, what's coming in on the freight liners? I think the second most important thing into New York City is hangers, metal hangers. And mm. then you have tons and tons and tons of textiles. It was, I hadn't, um, I had to use the restroom in this uh, like outdoor mini mall, like we stopped somewhere. And I walked past this store. You know, they have a lot of the high end brand stores. And I just looked in and I thought, Wow. And I hadn't been in a store like that. And I usually always buy secondhand, you know, or, you know, trade with friends, um, you know, exchange with my sister, like do everything else. And I just mm. walked by and I was like, wow, how arcane is this? We're living in 2021. This is so arcane. And it was people just trying on different things and they didn't fit. Right. This wasn't made for their body. And so this is another level of why. The make 2 million black size two, you know, <laughs> shirts is wrong. It's bad for the environment. It's mm -hmm. also bad for the psyche. I just watched for, you know, like they were trying, like pulling it over. And they're like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, there's too much here. And it doesn't fit me here or there. And I thought to myself, that's because we're living in these arcane fashion times of spray and pray. Um, I heard this woman that was in fashion for many years. And she um, was with this awesome group called 11 Radius. And they're a circular fashion group um, that great about information, sharing best practices. And she was sharing something. And she's like, I went overseas and I said, well, how many of these green size, you know, whatever bras do you make? And they said, well, we make 2 million in the green in that size and 4 million in this size. And, I thought to myself, wow, this is, again, this is like arcane. We have technology mm -hmm. that can scan your body, you know, <laughs> the know, that knows you. And so you don't have to, you don't have to waste your time. I think shopping is a waste of time. Like it's just, it's, mm. it just, you think about all the other things you could be doing, enjoying time with friends, like having a glass of wine, right? <laughs> and some delicious food and talking about life and having a picnic and going on a hike instead of, being in an air conditioned store that just has piles and piles and piles of stuff. I got like anxiety. Like I was like, look at these. There's mm. like, I looked at the stack of the white sweaters and the stack of the black sweaters and there's people flipping through and it's still, there's nothing there for them. This is a mismatch that technology can answer. And that's with, if you work with a designer that makes the item based on your body shape, size, indentations, that's what real design is. That's what real fashion is. And then using the dead stock and using the textiles we already have and using what's already in your closet, that's what the future of fashion is going to be. It'll be more relevant to you, mm -hmm. make you feel best. When it arrives, it fits like a glove, right? You just put it on. You're like, yeah, this, this is, I don't have to go get this tailored, right? It's not, the sleeves aren't too, too long. I, I don't, you know, it's, I don't have to return it. And what did I learn the other day? Um, Germany has the highest rate of return out of any country. Um, mm. Not sure why. I mean, this, I'm sure there's a lot of studies into that, <laughs> but and we have a lot of people who return things. They're like, I'm going to buy four sizes and then whatever I don't need, I'm going to return. And those returns, they get incinerated. They get put to second hand and then to landfill. <laughs> so I just think, Wow. This is, again, arcane, the mm. whole e-commerce system that we have, um, because we're not, again, making to that person's specific body shape, which we can do. The technology is all there. There's amazing technology for body scanning, for mapping to the design, for helping the designer. And then the designer does those last minute tweaks and making something beautiful that fits you and your body shape. So you don't have to sit there in a store 
flipping through for five hours, you know, flipping through, like, do they have one that's indented like this? Or do they have one that has buttons like that? Like, no, that's, let's design it from scratch, right from the get go, the way that you want it to fit you with the textiles that we are, already have in the world, because there's no need to make any new textiles. <laughs> hmm. I, I, it's, there's there's so much in there uh, for me. I, I think one thing you you mentioned earlier on, I think of some of the inevitable costs of scale and, and some of these these very large multinational mm -hmm. business models. You know, as as it relates to the space of fashion, uh, because for me it, it then leads itself to to some like what's needed is, is ultimately like a complete reimagination mm -hmm. of. Uh, uh, this industry, our relationship to fashion, because yeah, mm -hmm. just from the, the standpoint of there being, you know, inventory already there, as opposed to something that isn't, you know, what, what do you need and what's going to, to fit you? What's going to be something that's very mm -hmm. you know, valuable quality and, mm -hmm. and durable, uh, to where we can have that relationship to, to where, you know, made yeah. to order makes right? so much sense. <laughs> um, but I, I, as well, questions come up for me, Faith, too, because one thing, and you've mentioned a lot of uh, wonderful names there. We just recently published an interview with, with Monica oh, Park and Machine yes, Fancy nice. from 11 Radius. And I'm actually scheduled here for Monday to, to speak with Stephanie uh, uh, from, from Queen of Raw. So I'm looking forward to that. But one question mm -hmm. that's coming up for me now is we, we've started to have mm -hmm. more of these these conversations on uh, circular fashion economy specifically is, you know, what, what do we imagine happens it, if we don't need to, to make mm -hmm. any new textiles? Uh, what, what happens to the space of this, this industry, uh, the agricultural mm -hmm. component of this mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not sure what, what the answers are, but I'd be curious mm -hmm. to hear what, what perhaps your perspective is, is, you know, how maybe the, the future of, of fashion mm -hmm. might have to evolve, uh, if, that's something that we we don't want to have you know mm. interest in for the sake right. of you know uh, preservation and conservation Agriculture of our, our is cool. resources. Yeah, and, and I love it, Corey. Else. I'm so I'd be curious yeah, to hear. Agriculture is what, like what, one of my uh, side things too. I um yeah, I serve on the board <laughs> here, and which means I get my hands dirty at a local organic, no-till, sustainable, regenerative farm. Um, mm. and so I I just I'm fascinated by soil, and so. It, grows everything, right? <laughs> Including our textiles. But what happens to that, you know, cotton farmer that, um, so the world is getting so many more billions of people and we are already mm -hmm. running out of food. Food scarcity is huge. Water and food scarcity is huge for so, 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 so many people. Um, so if we can nurture that soil that you were grow that they were growing cotton on and transition it to grow food, there's a, there's going to be a massive demand for food. So helping those farmers do transitions, uh, I think to, you know, organic, sustainable, no-till growing, <laughs> regenerative farming, there's people in the United States that that's, they work for the USDA and they teach, they teach people regenerative farming and they show them, look, when you're using the pesticides, this is all you can grow. And look how you just have dry dirt, unsustainable, dry, on nutrient rich dirt uh, and look at over here, the regenerative farm right next to it, <laughs> you know, is just thriving because they're growing 80 different kinds of um, wheat and amaranth and things that the cows eat. And then the cows poop. And believe it or not, that is gold because that's what, you know, nourishes that soil. And then that's what creates nutrients for the food that we eat. Um, we've, we've done so much monocropping for textiles, for food, that uh, our soil is just so depleted. So I was talking to a biologist that said, um, the orange that you ate, uh, that you eat today uh, has, you know, you, you gotta eat four of them because it has so much less nutrients. So your grandfather only had to eat one of those oranges and now you have to eat four because the soil is just so depleted. So if we mm -hmm. transition these, and I know in certain parts of India, where I was talking to some of my friends, they are transitioning some of the textile cotton areas to like regenerating the soil and changing those to grow uh, organic food. 
uh, and that's it's certified organic. It's it's blockchained. The government is making sure uh, with the blockchaining. It's just really a neat model, and you see that happening in different places, and it's feeding the people that in the area and in the community, and then also you know goes to the stores and whatnot. So I think we need to cr turn to regenerative farming. Uh, not farming for textiles and <laughs> agriculture and then mm. and teach those people that um you know this is how you take care of the soil this is how you can transition uh and this is how you can grow different things and now you know now you have regenerative farming does have livestock um and so the livestock and then they they naturally know to move it's interesting because the cows will say i grew up next to cattle farm and the cows will say like in one area and they'll eat the different things and it's important for them to eat those 80 different kinds of grains that the farmer has grown in that area because mm -hmm. it creates such nutrient dense soil and then they know not to go back to that area for six months or so it's built into their brain and they go to the next area and they they make sure that microbiome is okay and they eat what's there and they go to the next area and you just do this rotation. We do it in a small way in the local, you know, one acre farm that we have here um, that I support. We have a little chicken coop and, you know, and the, little, the chickens, they, we just keep moving them to the different spots to make sure yes. that they keep replenishing the soil. Um, so it's, it's just, it's just that, you know, it's, nature knows how to take care of itself. <laughs> And if we work within nature, yeah. um, I, I, I don't think nature meant for us to grow textiles and <laughs> stuff for textiles. Uh, I think nature meant for us to grow food for all the beings on earth. Mm. I, 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 I like that. So I, it's just this, cause I, I, the thing that came up for me and I was having a conversation following one of, one of these recordings and I, you know, the question was, like we're reasoning through it, a, a friend of mine and I, and it's like, well, if we, you know, truly do uh, move to a circular economy, it's like, are, are there parts that were you know, supporting it that are then left out? And there's things that I'm okay leaving behind. Uh, I'm less interested about large multinational corporation uh, profits <laughs> and success. Personally, I, I like small and mid-sized businesses a lot localized more. localized supply but, chains with small businesses. That's the future. Yeah. Sure. I, I, and, and that is so much more culture rich mm -hmm. to me personally. I, I love that aspect of it. But then I start getting into the thought of, you know, because we have such a globalized mm -hmm. economy now, there are these communities that have become, you know, mm -hmm. quite dependent on different parts of these mm -hmm. international supply mm -hmm. chains, multinational supply chains. And so that was the question that was you know, proposed. It's like, oh, what, what happens to agriculture, agricultural yes. workers in the, the fashion industry specifically. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, that's, that's a solution that I'm on board for. I, I've become myself very, very, um, interested in soil. My, my wife and I have kind of started to homestead <sighs> here on our, our half acre in San Antonio. And, um, yeah, coming across the, the regenerative agriculture movement is a very exciting, is like the, one of the simplest things. It's this weird thing of like, yeah, if ultimately kind of left to its natural ways, you know, nature will kind of take care of itself. Mm. But now with all this mm. inertia and momentum that we've built up in a way that's perhaps not mm -hmm. as natural or as it should be, uh, we do need to uh, um, perhaps break down mm -hmm. many of these well-established mm -hmm. patterns and ways uh, to open ourselves up to, to something not really new. I want to say new, but it's like not so much yes, new, going, kind of going back to our was. roots, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and job training. I think I used to work back in the 90s um, for New Hampshire Job Training Council. And it reminded me, you know, that it was a lot of retraining. So people's jobs mm. who were no longer needed, we had a federal grant from the government and we would have $10,000 to retrain that person in a new job that was going to be needed. So I think the retraining and job training, um, and I think you always need that. It's, you know, it's, it, 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 and I think, Startups are, kind of get that. They're like, they're constantly innovating. They're constantly retraining their people mm. to learn new things, to, to adjust. I think if you don't, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> so I think that the retraining around, um, you know, you were sewing and you were sewing this same navy blue shirt, you know, 4 million of them, you and your colleagues here, uh, let's now retrain you, uh, with the like a deep sphere system to be a designer to and just think of like how much more exciting that would be 
I just think if I was making <laughs> a navy blue shirt every single day, like, and then transitioning to working one on one with somebody to learn about, hey, this was the sweatpants that my nana, you know, made and sewed the little pocket on too. And can you help me incorporate that into this t shirt or into this jacket or these pants? So that, you know, it's, it's modern, it's fresh for today. Just think of the mm. creativity that will let loose in people and how much, like, mm. think of the joy that will bring instead of this, like, robotic, make 10,000 of these, make 1 million of these, <laughs> same colors. Mm. And this, like, just think of the, the humankind connection there and how, and, and unleashing the creativity of the minds of these people that have been slogging through making that same new blue shirt, same like blouses, as, like, you know, I'm sure they don't want to make another ruffle. Right. <laughs> but mm -hmm. just think of the mindful connection and, and, and learning the new design techniques and keep, you know, saying, Oh, well, you know, this, I have these old buttons from the forties that we have here and we saved them. And, you know, I think we can incorporate it into your, jacket or your blouse this way with your um, circular fabrics. This whole connection of art, you know, it's like Etsy, right? You know, but on steroids. Right? Mm. So it's this whole, <laughs> like really connecting to the designer and the designers are working with you. And it's this beautiful dance where you're, you're expressing, mm. I, I'm, I can't wait to work with a designer because I, when I put things together, I'm like, I'm so dissatisfied with them. <laughs> but I just love when someone designs and they'll say, oh, well, just I'll put this piece here and put this piece here. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I would have never thought. I just I just don't think that way. You know, more hardware technology, that kind of stuff online. And um, I just think it's just how exciting that would be for both parties, for me as a customer to talk through. And what a special mm. treat, right? to talk to the, and just think of how many designers we'll need. It won't be that one designer saying it's, it democratizes it. Right. So you have right now you have the big brands and they say, you know what, this, this is, this is what's in style. I, they got five designers and those designers determine what we're all wearing. We all have such unique mm. personalities. We all have different likes and colors and textures and things that are meaningful to us. And so now, you know, working with that local designer, you know, I can, exp they can help bring out my expression instead of someone telling me, you know, in a non-democratized way, this is what's in vogue and this is mm -hmm. what you're going to wear. Yeah. I just think the future is going to be so mm -hmm. much more colorful <laughs> like, and just really, <laughs> or maybe not, maybe someone wants to be totally monochrome. And, you know, I have a friend like that's, you know, loves everything gray, loves where all love, just loves gray, loves everything gray. <laughs> that's cool. You know, so mm -hmm. that's how they express themselves. But I just think, yeah, the job training piece, it'll be training people to bring out their creativity, to learn to interact and, and learn to ask people questions so that they can pull out that person's desires and their, their vision and then make that vision come to life. Hmm. I, I really love it. I think, uh, I'm, I'm wondering like what, what's, where's the tipping point for us? Faith? Is it, cause there, like, is it, is it smaller fashion brands beginning to adapt and implement more of the, the, this technology that you say is, you know, that we have here, we have available to us. Is it a uh, consumer awareness or, or, you know, advocacy for, for a particular, new way of, of being and engaging with our clothes and in our economy, where do you think the tipping point is to this more colorful or monochromatic, <laughs> you know, depending on personal preference, yeah. uh, a future that, that you think is available. I to think us? It, it is awareness. You know, it's just like, it's one, it's one person at a time. So when you have a friend that says, Oh, I need to go to an event and I you want to go shopping with me. Say, you know what, could we use a local designer and, you know, that may not have any work right now. Could we work with them to take what you have in your closet and design mm -hmm. something that'll be so cool for that party because no one else will have it. How embarrassing it is you show up and it's like, oh, three other people have the same thing 
on as you. And now you're, again, it's that, it's that psyche thing for, especially for, I know for women, you know, I hang out in a lot of women's circles and this body image and just like seeing the same thing on somebody else and how it looks different, it can be psychologically damaging. But when you're wearing mm-hmm. something that is just made for you and, you know, out of the, that dead stock and out of those used textiles and it was designed for you mindfully, like you're going to rock it and you're going to walk in and no one else is going to have that. And that's going to be, it's mm-hmm. just against this uniqueness of you that emerges and you'll feel like so much better. And people are like, wow, tell me about, you know, <laughs> I keep telling Shamini, I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if we had like an invisible, like you just scan your phone, like a little QR code or RFID tag in it over that section. And then the story pops up, you know, about, and then the person's mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that that, you know, this pink sleeve, that's from your grandmother's pants that she sewed. Like, tell me more about your grandmother. It's conversation starters too. I, I just think mm-hmm. that'll be I, the tipping point. It's going to take a little bit, but it's just every person you talk to, like that conversation I had with that young lady that wanted to just, I need a pink shirt. Do you really like wear something really cool? Like, you know, for breast cancer awareness, right? Create something yourself. Sew something yourself. If you're, you enjoy sewing, like put it together or work with a local designer with the, the textiles we already have to make something really cool. That's unique to you. And I think that's when, when we change that cultural mindset, that will happen. But it is education. It's culture. Uh, I think the big brands too, I challenge every big brand that the next fashion runway that they do, that they don't use a single new thing, that they take Mm. only textiles that were already created. They take, I would love it if they take last season's items and textiles and then they transform them. What a challenge that is. And transform them into yeah. what is people think are cool today, right? And then get feedback from the community and local designers around that. That would be, I mean, I've seen a couple of those, you know, where they they design out of trash. And that's pretty mm. cool, I think, too. Or they design, you know, out of Doritos bag, which I think this convergence to of package, like all textiles don't, doesn't have to be cotton, right? <laughs> It can be lots of different mm-hmm. things. I saw one uh, made out of tires, which I thought was really interesting. I've, I've seen them, ma- again, made out of the, you know, milk containers. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's amazing when you, like, take something. I remember when I was little, I used to take the outside of the cheese, red cheese wax, you know, and I would make mm-hmm. it malleable in my hands. And then I would morph it into, like, a little sculpture, like a little rabbit or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just transform instead of throwing it away. I just think that if we look at mm. all the things that we consider trash today, that tipping point will be when we no longer have any more trash and that all of that trash is mm. just fully, it's circular. It's that interconnection. So right now we just look at textiles as this fabric. We've done a little bit with it with um, PET, like plastic. So a lot of our athleisure wear, um, it wicks away the moisture. It's made out of, you know, some of the old plastic bottles and things like that. And worn again, Cindy would be a great person to interview. Cindy Rose from Worn Again, um, Mm. where she's taking the textiles and when they're just no longer, you can't make them into anything else and breaking them apart. So say the plastic was like this and then the fiber was wound around it. She has a way that's patented to, take that apart so that you can reuse the plastic pellets for packaging or something. Again, it's that interconnection now of the circularity yeah. and the interconnected loops. The loop doesn't have to, look, it, closed loop is nice. You know, you, the same clothing company uses the same clothing over and over again, but I think the interconnected loops are even more powerful between the packaging that mm. you could use. I love what she's doing at Warn Again because it's now this can go back into some packaging, you know, for shipping or whatever. And now this textile can go back into textile or be made into something else, you know, be made into um, car seats. I really want the auto industry to start using used textiles for their seats. There's leather, the tons of mm. leather that's out there. There's tons of fabrics, you know, <laughs> gorgeous fabrics. I just can't wait till we have like, you know, like a seat. You know, I design my seat with my, you know, <laughs> old textiles from my closet. Just it, it's that extension, right? into different things or my couch. I just think that would be super cool. Mm. 
And so, I mean, I, I haven't even considered, I was like, yeah, you know, like just imagining <laughs> the, the backseat of, of our car, I'm like, hmm, what would we put right? on? Right. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in the, the example of you know, the a fashion show or, you know, auto industry uh, manufacturers, these are a lot of, of very large mm -hmm. companies. Um you know, what, in, in posing that challenge, maybe you've had, you know, actual conversations like these. I'm interested to know, and you don't know, have to name any specifics, but what, what are the points mm. of resistance? Mm. Because I'm imagining, is it, is it just, well, it's the mm -hmm. way that we've always done it <laughs> is, you know, create, create new things and, and, uh, uh, make our products out of that because they might be lacking this agility yeah. that, um, you know, Warren again has, mm. uh, a Shamini, Donna has, um, well, what are the points of resistance to doing something like that, accepting a, a challenge when they certainly do have resources, mm -hmm. you know, one, one way or another, I, I'd be interested if, if you have any insight to that. I think it's just changing the main, you have to change the manufacturing lines as well. Mm. You have to think a little bit different. Um, but they already are. There's an auto manufacturer company and they have seven vegetables in their car. And this is one mm. of the largest in the world. The foam <laughs> in their seats, I think, is uh, soy. You know, there's some that are t they use tomatoes. They use like the – and so there's people looking at – there's a woman, I forget her name, in Brooklyn, but she's looking into that kind of stuff. Like, Shamini turned me on to one that they take from the wine industry, the grape skins, and they make a fabric out of that. Again, it's these interconnected loops. Like, the grape skins are a waste. Yeah. They usually compost them, just kind of throw them out. Could we make something into mm -hmm. them, right? You have, um, oh gosh, uh, it's funny. I went into the store and I asked for them and the person was like, I don't really know what you're talking about. The Pinatex, which is made out of, so the top, mm. so the pineapple companies, they discard the outside of the pineapple and the top. It's really tough material, right? And when you kind of make right. that malleable and break it down the right way, they're making sneakers out of it. So I just think, <laughs> again, when we kind of, interweave what's waste for one. That's what nature does. You look at biomimicry, yeah. the waste of an output of one is the input of another. And if we can make that mm. connection and really look at nature and how nature does it, what's the waste of this in nature and how do they use it? I think we can create those interconnected loops and those connections. Mm. It's it's like it's a different part of your brain that triggers when <laughs> you mention something like that to me. To where you know taking this this byproduct of uh, pineapple waste, right, and and turning it into something like sneakers, you're like that just makes so yeah. much sense. But it's almost like it, you're seeing like a dog right. drive a car or something, where you're like, <laughs> no way, like really. Yeah. But it is a very mm -hmm. simple thing, and I I. I I'm always endlessly fascinated with that. And sometimes to the point to where the people who are making the product are like, yeah, it's no, it just makes yeah. a lot of sense. Cause oftentimes they have this kind of more engineer kind of like yeah. analytical technical thing. Like, yeah, why would this mm -hmm. be waste? Because, you know, in, in another way it can mm -hmm. be very useful. I'm like, no way. Yeah. How like, does that how, work? Like, what's it like? And it's just work? amazing. I think the other thing too, that you talk a lot about fast fashion, you know, on your site and I recommend everybody go to your site. Cause I was like, this is, you have some really cool, um, people that you've interviewed. And I really Thank love you. how you have, yeah. I always tell people sustainability, circularity, it includes social justice. It is like mm. intertwined a hundred percent. And I love how you did that with some of your sessions, um, all your sessions. It's just, it's just interesting because the, again, back to that biomimicry, I w was walking the other day and I think like I looked down at the soil and I think, Everything in there, that in one teaspoon of healthy soil, there's more micro healthy organisms than there are people on the planet. And the soil mm. makes it work, right? <laughs> so how can we make it work, right? <laughs> there's got to be a way. I just think we're so infancy. Um, but I, I think we'll we'll get there. It's just, it's, it's that learning process. You know, it was all, mm. it was the industrial age and it was all about like, mining things and making new and this throwaway society um, and morphing into that circular society. I think that, like you said, it's going to be tipping point. It's going to take some time. I, I'm inspired though, by all these startups you know, that are around that are doing it. I'm also inspired by there's larger companies that are doing 
uh, innovation and they're supporting the smaller startups, which I think is really mm -hmm. cool. Like Unilever, they have a, I mean, you can talk about Unilever. <laughs> you know, you can talk about all the big companies. I think they, they have a, a, a section of their site and it's all the smaller companies that are doing circularity. And mm. I looked at a couple other of the big fashion brands and I, I don't see the same thing. I think there's an opportunity there mm. for them to partner, to do the same thing. So like Danone used to be called Dan and in the United States, now they, they switched the name to Danone <laughs> and mm. they have something called Manifesto Ventures and it's their, you know, innovation. And that's where like they worked with local farmers and they can't come up with new, new products. I think that fashion companies, they do it a little bit. I see them at some of the circular events and they're starting to partner with some of the smaller companies, but I think they do that like a lot more. <laughs> I think they could be, mm. they, the smaller companies are more nimble. They can prototype faster. They don't have these big clunky, deep seated contractual supply chains. Uh, I just think that these larger companies, if they do partner with these smaller companies, it's it's a benefit for both. It's a symbiotic relationship. Like in nature, there's these symbiotic relationships. So it's like the, you know, the giant wildebeest, you know, or the animal in the in Africa. And they have the little birds that kind of sit on their backs and eat the little ticks off yeah. and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's really helpful. And they keep the flies off, you know, so they're, you know, the, it's like the smaller companies, that beautiful little white bird that's so useful. And then you have the, the larger animal and it's this symbiotic relationship and there's a lot better symbiotic relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm sure my biomimicry mentees would correct me at all. <laughs> be like, this is a better example. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that that a lot more of that needs to happen in order for this shift. And it, it is also, it's that, again, it goes back to education. We need to be teaching circularity between the ages of two and seven, because between two and seven, the developmental mm -hmm nature of the brain um, that will last through the rest of the lifetime. So if we're teaching circularity in the science class, I have a few science teachers I know, and they're teaching circular economy to their grammar school uh, students and to high school students. Um, also incorporating into college as well. So when you go for your MBA, you should learn about circular business. What is circular business? Why is it mm -hmm. beneficial? Because there's a reason why the second word is economy. <laughs> It's good business sense to do these things. Um, mm. The other thing I want to mention too is resources. So resource, a lot of people don't know. There's a diagram that shows when we'll be running out of each one of the resources that are in every single one of our products. And that wheel <laughs> is when I used to speak across the world, I used to sh just start with that wheel. And I would start with the cost mm. too. So how costs have gone up because for example, like there's something that's uh, an element that's in the screens that we're looking at right now. And we're running out of that. And we've run out in some areas completely. And so the cost of your product is gonna go up. So if you, you look as if you're a fashion company and you look at what's going into your fabrics, it is more costly to make, make that. And it's gonna get more costly as labor goes up, you know, as the resource constraints increase. So you're better off to make from the used, right? To, it's like this endless stream of textiles that we have that we could be utilizing mm. that it's, it's just eventually it will catch up and we have to be careful of those resource constraints because you'll run out of that indigo dye you know, you know, I'm just, or something else that it's part of your product. And so you have to look at that cost piece as well and, and look at all of that and say, you know what, if we're um, not making from new, we're not paying people to pick the cotton, to grow the cotton, to transform the, to weave the cotton, to, <laughs> to then dye the cotton, to then sew the cotton. Like, could we be just transforming a, a, the 3000 blue shirts that were made last year, right? <laughs> So mm. could yeah. we just be transforming those and that into something a little bit different, you know, with some of the buttons that we have from 20 years ago with some of this, this other fabric, I just think that it's, it's mm -hmm. better for business and it, and it will become even more so because of the constraints and also the laws as well. If you look at the green new deal in Europe, um, it's circularity is built into that. So you, you will be yeah. paying fines or you will be paying 
increased cost if you are not circular. So it's it's the public policy, it's the education, and it's also changing the culture, and then implementing using technology to layer over that to make the circularity happen. Mm. Sorry, I'm running on. Mm. <laughs> no, no, uh, I I love that that e- example too. I of starting to to really grasp the the gravity of of what that means to to run out mm. of particular resources there's one campaign uh i think in the last year or so done by new belgium brewing uh, a certified b corporation brewery who i think they they had for a limited amount of time listed their their six packs you know in convenience stores or whatever for 100 dollars or something yeah. like that to you know, say this is ultimately mm-hmm. what the the cost of production would be forecasting yep. out, you know, to to some future time period when we'd be you know water would be mm-hmm. uh, harder to obtain and um and, and therefore the agricultural process would be quite expensive uh and and so that that really stuck with me too that was very impactful I think very smart mm-hmm. uh, and kind of hard I love that campaign, campaign. That, I that hadn't heard ran. of that Corey that's cool thanks for sharing that one. Yeah, I might be mixing okay. some specifics, but I remember the it was story's still good. It, it was a, a, <laughs> a, a, a creative one. Uh, well, Faith, I, I want to be respectful of of your time here. Uh, I think I, I notice, especially in conversations like this, where we are uh, talking about the the seriousness mm-hmm. of um, you know what is the, the current climate, uh, the the momentum perhaps against us in some ways to make some really dramatic mm-hmm. shifts, you know, in, in speaking to the fashion industry for one and noticing here in this conversation, uh, you've had me feel definitely more optimistic, hopeful, and, and that's inspired. good. My middle name I, is hope. Very so, much you know, so. I, my dad's like, you get to share hope oh, all the time. Quite, <laughs> quite fitting, quite fitting. But uh, uh, one last question for you, mm-hmm. Faith, uh, w- what might be, one bit of of advice that you'd share with our listeners, folks who are are aspiring or are active change makers in one mm. way or another here what what's one piece of advice that you might leave them with you can if you're an entrepreneur you know start with the the next life in mind, not the end in mind you know under mm. you know see the the circle and if you are an entrepreneur, you're in a, an organization and you're trying to create change. I was an entrepreneur in my last organization. Don't be afraid to prototype. Just ask. I just asked my boss, I want to pro- I want to build this prototype. And it was amazing because mm. it's like build it and they will come. That really happened. Like lots of different players <laughs> came, um, including Stephanie Benedetto. <laughs> so I just think if you, and use all your resources and, and just keep having the conversation. Um, I was at a party. And, you know, there was, it's plastic free July. <laughs> um, and so I brought my, my reusable spork, you know, I brought my cloth napkin, um, my little silly cup, my silicon reusable cup that kind of folds up my purse. <laughs> and people are like, you know, it just started the conversation. They were like, oh, I noticed uh, that you, you brought your, and I said, well, it's plastic free July, you know, and we're, you know, if we each did this then we would reduce the amount of plastics in our water and in our food, which um, is leading to an increased rate of uh, colon cancers in those in, in their 20s. That's uh, so why they've reduced the screening level with the age range down. Um, and just think, you know, we could create a better future and healthier future for all the children that you see here at this party. And then the woman was like, mm-hmm. wow, that's I mean, she was like, that's, that's really cool. Like, I think it like caught her, caught her back a little bit because she's not in this industry and, um, didn't know anything about this. So, so it's just, whether you're sitting on the subway, you know, chatting with someone next to you, whether you're, you know, in a store, you know, (laughs) mention something that, you know, and, and again, keep bringing it into the conversation, embed it into the conversation and map it to that person's goals. Do you want to show up at the party wearing the same thing as somebody else or show up looking fabulous with something that's just unique to you? So mm. keep talking inside your organizations um, as an entrepreneur and tr- and prototype and you'll and gain your allies and your supporters and, and champions and, and keep, you're going to have hard days, but <laughs> keep plugging at it, 
you know, for zero waste and for circularity. And then as an entrepreneur, there's so many entrepreneurs I know they're doing so well that have circular companies right now. And they, they're just, they're, they can't even keep up. They said with the demand. So hmm. it's out there. People want it. So if you want to start your own company, go right ahead, you know, be that social entrepreneur and then environmental entrepreneur and combine the two, <laughs> which is because they're together and, and just, Keep trying at it because the tipping point will, will happen if it hasn't happened already in some areas. Mm. And I, you know, I, I certainly like to believe that, that the wave is headed all in that direction. And perhaps from the entrepreneurial perfective, it helps to ride a big yeah. wave, you know? So <laughs> there's a lot of investment uh, I think that's, dollars that's out there. A, there's so right. much now in, um, with, like I said, larger companies investing in smaller companies that are circular and kind of seeing what they're doing, as well as the mm -hmm. regular investor. So you have like Change Finance. Change Finance takes the S&P and they take out all the fossil fuels. And I keep watching my Change Finance stock and it's it's doing, it's always in the green there. It's always doing really well. <laughs> so it's it's interesting, you know, what, what people are doing to, you, you can make an impact around the investment as well. There's large banks too. Mm. I have uh, a lot of friends that work at large banks and they, and financial institutions, and they're looking for uh, companies to invest in that are socially and environmentally responsible because they know mm. that that is where the market is going. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, yeah. Larry Fink's letter, you know, from BlackRock. Uh, it's, it's, it's a demand now, not just a nice to have. And you'll see in the financial rating soon that, you know, people aren't separating it out anymore. They're the risk portfolio managers are including um, the risk of those companies that have environmental and social risk and they're rate ranking them down. So it's, mm. it's a financial thing now too, which is really cool because that's when things really happen. Mm. Lovely. Faith, thank you so much for, for taking the time here to chat with me. Uh, lastly, where is, is the best place for folks to keep <laughs> up with you uh, and, and follow everything that, that you have to sure. say? And it'll be, it's, it's quite divergent. I do a lot of divergent thinking as design thinker, but on my LinkedIn, and I like to do a lot of reposts because I believe in promoting others. Um, so yeah, I'm just mm. Faith Lejeune on LinkedIn. So that's Faith Legend with an RE on the end on LinkedIn. Perfect. We'll have that linked up in the show post at growonsoul.com. Nice. Nice. Thank again, you, Corey, Faith. for the opportunity. <laughs>